it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Michael Myers is a beloved horror character, primarily due to his enigmatic and relentless nature. He represents the quintessential embodiment of evil, masked and emotionless, making him a chilling and enduring symbol of fear. The mystery surrounding his motives and his ability to survive seemingly insurmountable odds over multiple films kept audiences captivated and consistently drawn to his iconic presence in the horror genre. But what if there was a more simple explanation as to his actions? This is what we will see in tonight's four-part story. October's End by Caleb Slieger Part 1 Your mind screams at you. Confusion and frustration overwhelm you. Every time a thought comes to you, it's quickly blown away like a flower blooming in a tornado. So you sit. You adapt. The quiet thoughts stay the longest. You can keep them longer when you don't force things. You begin to notice things when you just listen to the quiet thoughts. Well, something's different today. Dr. Lume sits down in the seat across the other side of a table from you. A table separated by a thick protective glass and monitored by old dusty surveillance cameras. You immediately know something is off with the good doctor. Your mind's been a fog ever since that fateful night 17 years ago. The witches, your big sister, your mother, your family. It all spins in your head constantly, never stopping. You ache to finish a task that's already dead and done. But it burns at you and eats at you, like a fever dream left only half dreamt. No, never mind, concentrate. Dr. Lume is different. He's not himself. He's not the same psychiatrist that's come to visit you in your captivity for the last 17 years. It's someone impersonating the doctor. And this impersonator tells you he's here to help you. Nicholas Norris, the imposter says to you, barely above a whisper, I've come to break you out. You have to finish what you started 17 years ago when you killed your sister on Hallow's Eve. Fake doctor leans in towards the smudged glass. You try your hardest to keep your mind clear to understand this stranger's words. You had a sister born the year you were committed. Your mother adopted her out to one of her coven to hide her from your wrath. Your younger sister will come into her unholy power this 31st. Just like the power your sister Judith came into on Halloween night when you killed her. The coven's bloodline continues. You know you can't talk with the man across the glass from you. The coven has cursed your tongue long ago to lie flat in your mouth, and your mind inflicted to be in a constant state of confusion. But your heart remembers the divine mission laid upon your bare soul, and the mental fog lifts for a moment. You understand what the stranger is saying. He's telling you the job isn't over. There's another witch to kill. Another sister of your own flesh and blood that must die. I put you in for a transfer to a higher security facility on the 29th. Me and you are going to engineer a little detour and go on a witch hunt in Haddonview. Do you understand? The buzzer sounds and the meeting with the fake Dr. Lume comes to an end. He stands quickly and feigns an adjustment to his gold watch, pulling down his sleeve to reveal the edges of a tattoo the real doctor didn't have. Your keen eyes see ancient script written upon his skin and it awakens something within you. It's Enochian, the words of divinity. Happy birthday, Nicholas, the man says before quickly turning to leave. Well, you do begin to understand. The angels begin to sing slowly in your ears, slow at first, but louder than they have in years. By the time the orderlies get you back to your cell, the singing is almost as loud as they were on your tenth birthday. The first time you heard the glorious choir. That night you easily slip from your restraints and strip naked to stand alone in your padded cell. You trace your fingers along the winding scars marking your body. The 
as the Seraphim's music grows to a glorious crescendo inside your skull. The intricate, self-imposed scars are also written in the language of God. They spiral out over you as a beautiful enchantment against your pale, sun-deprived skin. The blessing came to you in a vision around eight years ago. In the vision, you were instructed not to finish the inscription of holy symbols upon your body until you were given a sign. Tonight's the night to finish the work. You squeeze your hand behind a mat you've gently pried away from the wall and retrieve a razor blade you'd hidden years ago. You know the words scarred on your skin, but don't understand the meaning. You know only where to etch the words into skin, but instructed not to dot any of the I's or cross any of the T's in a lot of the symbols. You had to leave little imperfections to keep the blessing from taking its full effect on you. You didn't want to tip your hand to the coven too soon. But now you must finish the incomplete signals placed upon you years ago. And so you spend the night searching your body, finding little places that need a flick of the razor to complete the miraculous patterns. You've grown tall and muscular over the years, and the red annotations of blood begin to add up contrasting against cuts of red across your white skin. After each cut into your skin with a bloody razor, you feel the mental curse upon you lessen, the cloud upon you lifting, and the sunlight finally shining through. You start to remember. It all started in 1963, you believe. Or was it 1693? But today is 1978, right? Still foggy, but it's coming back especially the past lives. You always come back. And the witches always come back too. The coven of Esther. God always puts you close to the problems he wants you to the soul. This new memory of a voice feels like, well, an old one. You remember an older woman's voice saying it to you. Though you can't remember who told you this, the voice fills you with such heartache and sorrow that you want to weep you don't know why. After all the correct incisions have been made with a razor, you put on your red jumpsuit back over your bleeding red body and have a deep sleep in your cot, letting the blood dry on your skin and stain the clothes. A vision comes to you and you're guided through the past. Halloween 1963 comes back to you. It's varied and clear, just like the youthfulness that was within you at the time. You remember only days before had the seraphim began singing to you on your 10th birthday, letting you know about your holy purpose. First it frightened you because they told you to do horrible things. Still voices communed with you non-stop, even through the night. They told you that you begged for this mission in a previous life. They said you'd fallen on your knees and lay prostrate before God Almighty and implore God to let you be the one that comes back over and over. The angels accuse your sister of being a witch, a witch that comes back to life after life due to her pact with the devil. Her powers would come into fruition on Halloween night of her 17th year of life. Any person that lays with her will be under her complete control, and she'll be able to dominate the person as her personal slave and thrall. Well, you don't understand. Of course you don't. But the angels persist, and they tell you the path will be shown to you. In the meantime, you must keep an eye on Judith, and you must prepare. Well, you feign sickness to get out of trick-or-treating Halloween night. Judith volunteers quickly to stay home and babysit while your parents go to a late-night party thrown by the governor. Judith sneaks her boyfriend Robbie over. You like Robbie. Rob would bring over his Jack Russell for you to play with on several occasions. You can never have pets at your house, but Robbie let you play with tops. The angels tell you to hide in Judith's closet. You do, and you hate yourself for doing it. Robbie and Judith start kissing on the bed. Robbie is excited. Judith tells him she's ready for him. Ready for what, you think? They both make weird noises as they kiss. <sighs> you hate that, too. The angels say you can look away, and you do. The noises are gross and kind of silly, but they don't last long. 
When it stops, you look up to see Robbie standing naked by the bed, like he's in a trance. Judith, covered only in blankets, sat smiling a sinister smile at him. Mother was right, she said, but I need a test to see the extent of the master's power. Now, oh, go and get that damn dog. Robbie almost runs out of the room naked before Judith cackles gleefully and tells him to put on his clothes first. When he leaves, she goes to sit at her vanity and brush her hair out, just like you've seen a million times. Robbie came back quickly, since he only lived a few houses down. His presence was announced by the heavy front door slamming and the excited barks from tops. Oh, Robbie, sweetie, Judith called out down the stairs. Get trash bags. When Robbie finally made it back upstairs, he was holding his dog in a big trash bag. You think Tops is going to give away your hiding spot because he looks at the closet and starts barking. Jeez, Rob, put him in the bag before he wakes Nick up. Judith hisses at Robbie as she spins around from her vanity to face him. Her face is meaner than you've ever seen it before, and it scares you. Oh. <sighs> Kill the mutt. Stab it. Show me you love me, she commanded, her demeanor instantly to mischievous glee. She produced a giant pair of scissors, holding it out in both hands like she was Excalibur to a knight. Instantly, Robbie snatched up the scissors and began stabbing poor Tops in the bag. You avert your eyes again, and once again the noises from the dog don't last long. Oh, at least poor Tops died quick. Hot tears run down your face, and you can hear Robbie begin to sob as well. Worst is the childlike giggling of your big sister. You hear the clank of the scissors hitting the hardwood floor. You look up to see them covered in blood, and your nude sister standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with her defeated boyfriend. Good boy, she chides. There's only room enough for one dog around here. Now go throw it away in a dumpster down the street and never mention this to anyone. Robbie picked up the limp sack, puts it over his shoulder and runs out of the house crying. Judith giggled to herself, spun on her toes and went to sit back down at her vanity. She began to hum a sweet tune as she brushed her hair out, just like you've seen her do a million times. She was your sister, but not just like you'd seen her do a million times. Oh, this cruelty felt familiar. It was something twisted. The angels sing for vengeance. Your head begins to hurt. Oh, they won't shut up. Just like you have seen her do a million times. You saw the three of them compel the man to put those innocent women on stakes. Oh, they burned. Oh, the way their skin pops and blackens as they scream. They say behind every great man is a great woman. Not you. You corrupt. You Poison, yells the familiar woman's voice in your mind. There's a memory full of emotional pain, just as much as her voice is filled with the physical pain. Who was this kind woman your heart hurts for? When the angel screamed, she'd be stopped before more things than just dogs will die. You know what they're capable of. Their cruelty is endless. The three matriarchs of Esther can never find each other again. Before you know it, you're standing in the middle of the room, scissors in hand. You have no idea how long you've been like this. Somehow Judith hasn't noticed you lurking behind her. You see yourself clearly in the mirror of her vanity, but her head is down. She's writing in her diary. Just like you've seen her do a million times. She wrote in the diary after she and the other two matriarchs had the men stack all those bricks on top of your mother's frail body. She giggled to herself and took notes back then also. The year was 1692. No, no, it's 1960. No, it's, it's 1692. Hot anger floods you. You remember the brutal ways they had the witch hunters torture your mother. Well, she was innocent, caring and pious. Yeah, the coven sought her out to falsely accuse and torture her to death. All just for their fun. You jam the scissors deep into her left armpit, almost at the shoulder. 
Judith lets out a yelp of surprise and pain, and spasms out of her chair to smack against the wall to the right of her. She looks at you with wild eyes, and you almost feel sympathy for the person that has been your big sister for ten years. Nicholas, you little freak, she screams. She reached over and under to check her wound with her right hand. She brings back a hand covered in her own blood. Blood was leaking from her left side at an alarming rate. She slides down the wall to a sitting position, blinking repeatedly like she's growing dizzy, blood gushing out to the floor. There's a moment of silence between you and your sister. She realizes she's going to die. You're now going to be a murderer. Her pupils grow dilated, and the dark pool of red spreads around her naked body. You're... Him, she says weakly. The one who follows. Different every time, unlike us, the shapeless. Your God put you right under our noses, she growled. She shifted forward and barely had enough strength to speak. God, I should have strangled you in the crib. God always puts you close to the problems he wants you to solve. You replied, but Judith was already dead. At least you remember who taught you the saying this time. It was your kind mother from centuries ago. The mother you partially avenged tonight. And still it remains partially complete to this day. Judith is dead, but the mother was still alive at the time. She was building the coven and getting her hooks into politicians. She died in a plane crash eight years ago. Well, once the mother died, you thought you were free from worrying about the coven's three matriarchs being reborn and causing havoc during this generation. They always reincarnated within the same family. Now the family was believed to be dead. But now, now, a secret daughter has been discovered. The bloodline continues. She comes into her power in two days. She has to be stopped. You have to get to Haddonview. You have to kill your youngest sister on Halloween. Part 2 October 30th arrived and somehow the fake Dr. Lume convinced the county sanitarium to only send one elderly orderly, Mr. Herman, along for the transport. You sat motionless in the back seat most of the ride, chained up head to toe, as fake Lume drove his giant Cadillac closer up the road to Haddonview. Fake Lume planned a route through Haddonview on the way to your new high security facility. This was a facility he'd never had plans on you reaching. You noticed that Herman wouldn't drink any of the coffee offered to him from Lume's personal thermos. Dr. Lume seemed to get more and more frustrated with Mr. Herman the closer they got to Haddonview. Mr. Herman kept making remarks like, I'd save a whole hour of travel if we just stayed on the interstate and avoided Haddonview, Doctor. The arguments between the two in the front got worse and worse until Herman announced what he'd been ordered to do by the big bosses that ran the whole mental health system. I don't think I'd have to do it, Doc. The older man said as he pulled a small revolver from his inside pocket. But the council gave me permission to detain you if we go anywhere near Haddonview. You are acting crazy as one of our patients. You won't listen to reason. Why haven't you even once asked me about Nancy and her treatments? Come on, Doc. It's like you're not even you anymore. Oh, you've heard enough. Like a cobra conserving the power of its strike for years... Your violence exploded like a whip snapping, severing the chain that held your limb secure. It sent an explosion of metal ringlets shooting all over the inside of the caddy as your body launched into sudden, violent motion. Your fist connected with the side of Mr. Herman's face and sent it to crack the passenger side window next to him with tremendous force. It appeared almost as if Herman shot himself with his own gun and spiked his head to the right against the door window. Jesus, Nicholas, fake Lume screamed as he slams on his brakes and brings the car to a skidding halt on the side of the road. Did you kill him? 
fake doctor checked Herman's neck before he turned to you with relief on his face. He told you the senior orderly wasn't dead, but very concussed. But even worse, the revelation now was that Dr. Lume knew the coven was onto the plan to kill their last sister before midnight this Halloween. Lume leaned over and gave the unconscious Herman a jab of something from a syringe to keep him sedated for the rest of the night. Finally, the fake doctor would stop pretending and began to talk freely with you. We are close now, said Lume as he clenched the steering wheel and took deep breath. You heard an accent come through that hadn't been there minutes before, now that Lume was using his real voice. The flustered ball of a man barely maintained his bearings and stared forward while he explained how close you two were to the target. This is something you already knew, because the voices had just told you ten minutes ago. Now, once we cross the city limits, the coven may have defensive magical barriers set up to detect us, so we must move quickly and carefully. Our best plan of action would be to identify your sister at the local high school tomorrow during school hours and eliminate her after she gets out of class on her way home from school. We could intercept and kidnap her by one of the unsold houses on Shatner and White. Dr. Lume started digging around in his book bag next to him. He turned around in the squeaky driver's seat and handed something to you. You look at it with awe and curiosity. The angelic voices spike in your head with excitement. Your ears pop and you feel an electric snow blast of numbness fizzle immediately between your nose, ears and every other extremity. You are, almost with a divine reverence, presented with a simple task. Although it only appeared simple in design, but also in construction. It was made of many, many pieces of tiny crystal, all somehow formed together. There's no identifying nose or mouth, only two dark eye holes where somehow the crystals were blackened around the openings. The texture of the mask was rough and sharp to the touch, so you flipped it over to look at the inside, or the part that went against your face. The inside was lined with some sort of smooth paper with Enochian writing in microscript along every millimeter of it. You believed it truly was a work of art, a holy relic. This mask has been constructed by the Witch Hunter's Order for your return. It's meant to amplify your God-given blessings tenfold, Lume said with deep reverence. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and you shall remain shapeless and uncursable by the foul coven as long as you wear this. You looked at Lume as tears formed in your eyes, and you wished you could speak. You grunted and gestured the mark towards him, and hope he sees the worry in your expression. Thankfully, he understood and answered the unasked question. Oh, me? Lume answered, and he stopped, whipped the tears from his eyes, and lifted his trench coat. Inside the lining of the leather coat, you saw the meticulously silver lettering of Enochian stitching all throughout the inside of his black jacket. Ah, this should give me adequate protection for the hunt. Plus, the witches don't know my actual name. They still think I'm Dr. Lume. And even if they find out I'm an imposter, I cover the tracks of my real identity well. But uh, we must get on our way and off the road. As soon as we're in the city limits, the coven will have the entire town looking for us. But I have a hideout ready. We can keep poor Herman nice and subdued until we're done. I'm sure he's just a pawn in all of this. Dr. Lume went to crank the Cadillac back to life when the telltale red and blue lights of a police car lit up the car from behind. For a moment, the angels fell silent and the fake doctor spun around to look at you with a stunned expression. You knew witchery was at work because the voices didn't warn you. Ah, hide the mask under your seat. Slip on these cuffs, Lume whispered harshly. They may be stadies, not local cops. We may be in luck. You sat quietly, eyes closed, with a new pair of cuffs loosely around your wrists, confident in the knowledge that violence was coming regardless of whoever stepped out of that patrol car. You heard two footsteps approaching, one loud and brazen, 
the other holding back towards the passenger side. You hear the swish of leather. Somebody's already drawn their weapon on you. You feel a flashlight hit your closed eyelids as a large man passed your window and began his shtick with Dr. Lume. They talked back and forth for a while. Dr. Lume lied convincingly by saying he'd pulled over to check his map because he was transporting you and didn't want to wake up Mr. Herman. He said Mr. Herman had taken a pill for a headache and was asleep. Oh, the fake doctor was putting on a good poker face, telling half-truths and pretty lies that would have gotten him out of any normal traffic stop. All seemed to be going well. The trooper was about to hand back his license before he paused. Well, doctor, your ID says Samuel Lume, but I'd rather call you by your real name, David Carpenter. Well, the farce was over. The fake doctor... David Carpenter, his face suddenly changed from amicable to dead serious as he threw the car into drive and stepped on the gas. You instantly threw your head to the side, knowing the cop behind you was going to fire, as a bullet blew out the window, sending glass raining all over your head and shoulders. As the vehicle burned rubber away from the two troopers, you calmly slipped the crystal mask over your face and pulled your hand out of those loose cups. You think it's strange that the red and blue lights aren't chasing you? You figure there are cops waiting ahead, and that you and Lou Mate, well, David, will have to abandon the vehicle. The angel screeched a quick warning in your head. It was piercing and frantic, but it was too late. You see the sign for Haddon View City Limits zipped by the window. As soon as the Cadillac crossed into the city limits, Lou Mate, David, violently coughed up blood all over the steering wheel like a vomit of red mist. Mr. Herman, even in his drug sleep, let out the same cough of blood from his mouth and nose and issued out a horrid wail. You felt the hateful sting of a death curse ravaging your entire body. The killing effects of the curse had only barely been fought off by your tattoos and holy mask. The Cadillac swerved back and forth across the road, as David's skin started to redden and boil like he was being cooked in an oven. Mr. Herman was already in a full-blown seizure, as blood poured from all the openings on his face. You buckled your seatbelt like the voices in your head urged you to, as Lume, David, also began to seize up. The car crossed into the opposite lane of traffic and ran off into a steep ditch, hitting the dirt with enough force to flip the car into the divot of the ditch, the vehicle landing sideways on its right side. You hung in your seatbelt for a while, trying to reorient. The fake doctor and Mr. Herman hung limply too. Lines of their blood had fallen to form shallow pools along the passenger's side door. They weren't seizing anymore. They died. You knew the witch hunter and old orderly had suffered a gruesome death just because they were close to you. Now those two cops were coming to kill you car was sideways, and you had to reorient yourself to climb up for freedom. You unbuckled, opened the passenger door above you like an overhead hatch, and climbed out to stand atop the sideways car for a quick moment. But a quick moment was all that was needed for the two cop assassins on your tail. A flashlight quickly blinded you from the road, and rapid-fired gunshots pierced the air. You felt the bullets hit you, and crumpled forward and fell off the car and towards the side of the road. Got him, Sarge, said a voice. Good. Make sure the two in the vehicle are dead. I'll secure our prisoner for the coven, said voice two. You lay face down on the asphalt, pain shearing through your left shoulder, gut, and right leg. All the shots were non-lethal, and you highly doubted that was the cop's intention. It was more likely your holy blessing protecting you and not allowing any weapons raised against you to prosper. Still, the blessing didn't keep these things from hurting. Enough black magic or malicious intent can dampen your protective blessing and kill you. You watched through the dark eyes of your mask as a younger trooper ran by you to the Cadillac. A bigger, fatter trooper walked over to look down at you. Yeah, ain't you supposed to be some sort of boogeyman? Fat Trooper said, You ain't shit. And look, 
You already came pre-cuffed for me. He put his considerable weight onto you, with his knee in your back. He reached over to grab the dangling handcuff from your left wrist that Lumi had put on you earlier. And it took all your strength not to grunt in pain from the cop's weight and remain motionless until you felt his hand touch yours. The fat cop grabbed your wrist with the cuff around it and you spun to your back, using all your core force to rotate like an alligator and flip the fat cop off of you. He landed on his back to the left of you. Instead of trying to get up, he fumbled for his gun in his holster. You took your precious moment of opportunity that he'd given you and leapt onto him to pin him on the asphalt. He attempted to put his gun right in your face and fired, but you dodged his hand like you'd dodge a punch and his gun shot blasted into the dark sky above you. With your left hand, you sling the dangling cuff up and grab him in a fist. You swipe down in an arch of deadly accuracy. A sick thunk cuts off the cop's growls of protest. Your eerily efficient swipe hooked the serrated edge of the fang-like metal of the unlocked handcuff into the trooper's throat. You quickly rip the curved metal free along with a large chunk of his throat and slung it down the road in one gruesome motion. The Sarge was dead. Now for his partner. Oh God, you monster! You heard him gasp as you jumped to your feet and turned to face him. He's standing right in front of you, desperately trying to dump the spent brass out of his revolver for a reload. Well, you let him load up. You're curious. How far does the blessing go? This is your first time reincarnated with firearms so prevalent everywhere. He shakes and loads up one by one dropping two more bullets on the ground. A small fire started to glow inside the overturned vehicle. Smoke slowly started to rise out onto the road, obscuring both of you in wisps of black smoke. What do you want? he asked. You noticed he can't keep eye contact with you. He kept wincing in pain when he looked at the mask. You, why are you so blurry? He holds his pistol out, pointed at you. Look, if I can't do this, the coven will hurt my family. The trooper screams at you. Screw your town. Screw this post. Screw Sarge for getting me twisted up in this magic bullshit. The trooper then closes his eyes to pull the trigger. The first trigger pull blew off your left ear. As the second one was coming, you decided not to put your faith in God to a foolish test. Uh, you decided to kill this guy before he ended your holy mission right there on the road. The second trigger pull never came, because there was a bang from another direction, and the trooper's head rocked to the side. He fell backwards into the burning wreckage behind him. The trooper didn't scream or thrash about as the flames engulfed his clothes and body, telling you he was already dead from the mystery gunshot. You turned on your heels towards your right, facing down towards Haddonview and the unknown shooter's direction. You immediately made out the silhouette of a darked-out police car as a man walked towards you. As the man got closer, you saw he was wearing a Haddonview local police uniform and aiming a hunting rifle at you. Nick, Nicholas, the man shouts as he rushes forward to jab the barrel of the hunting rifle into your chest. His face is weathered and he has an insane look in his eye. Hey, uh... Still in there, kid? Realization hits you. The man in front of you is Robbie, Judith's old boyfriend. He looks stressed and world-weary, but he stares up at you with a glimmer of hope. Oh, we don't have much time. Part 3 Did you hear me? We gotta move, Sheriff Robbie said to you. You went and climbed atop the flip Cadillac and pulled the poor fake doctor's body out of the vehicle before the flames could engulf him. You took off his trench coat and laid him gently on the cool dirt. Was he a friend? Maybe he was the closest you ever had in this life. Even after his death, his trench coat would still help you fulfill your mission, and you thought he'd like that. You put it on with reverence. 
As you walk back to Robbie, he gestures for you to follow him further down the road to his patrol car. He was giddy with anticipation and scanned the darkness for threats. You're here for the girl, aren't you? Your little sister, right? He asked with wild eyes. You just stared down at him through your blank mask. But upon Robbie's, you saw the years of pain and turmoil sketch upon his visage. Maybe he suffered just as much as you. Oh, the coven fawns over her and caters to her every whim. Her security has doubled recently. But I know something big's happening tomorrow. It's just like that night, Nick, Robbie said with a glazed over look. Just like when Judith got in my head and violated me. They want the same power for her. They want everyone to suffer like I did that night. Robbie snapped out of his flashback and ushered me to follow him to the back of his patrol car with visible excitement. He popped the trunk and pulled out two slabs of metal connected with straps of Velcro and flexible cloth. You had no idea what it was. Here, you dumbass. It's got a bulletproof vest he says as he slammed it into you. Once I got back from Nam, I decided I wasn't going to let one of these punks on the streets put a hole in me and finish what Charlie couldn't. Robbie helped you put on the vest. You realized it was just two slabs of inch-thick sculpted iron. The iron was beaten into flat slabs and then molded to fit over a man's chest and back. And these modern-day armor parts were held in place by a makeshift carrier that consisted of two tied-off cloth strips and Velcro bits. Your torso did begin to resemble a mummy with the amount of wrapping Robbie was doing to keep the vest secured for the fight ahead. Once Robbie tightened a corner too snugly and you realized he didn't consider how hard the vest would be to remove after the fight was over, well, that's when you realized Robbie didn't think you'd come back. To Robbie, this heavy vest was also a coffin for you. Oh, her name's Jamie. Lives in a big house on West Cray Street. Say she has the potential to be more powerful than her mother or sister. I keep talking about her being some sort of uber-special, well, the profane virgin. Well, you had the information now that Robbie had intervened. You weighed the plan with the voices in your head. They jumped in urgency at the words, profane virgin. Time had become even more precious. You made your decision and nodded to yourself. Almost like a quick draw, you quickly stuck Sheriff Robbie on the side of his neck with an open knife hand just hard enough to cause him to lose consciousness. You knew Robbie can't come with you. You'd already lost the witch hunter who was only trying to help. You felt genuine empathy for Robbie's emotional pain all this time. This is where the two of you diverged in your paths. You catch him in one arm and slid him into the trunk of his car. You know you had to make it look good so the coven didn't suspect he helped you. Now, to help with the farce, you took the bloody sharp edge of your cuff and tried to cut into his cheek and forehead and, and let the fat cop's blood cover his face. You closed the trunk and used your fist to beat massive dents into it in an attempt to make it look like Robbie had just barely escaped your rage by hiding in the trunk of the squad car. Finally, you initiated your determined executioner walk towards Haddonview. Now, to anyone watching, you would have appeared as a giant wearing an expressionless white mask, wrapped up in some sort of thick black padding, while flipping on a large black trench coat to stretch over all of it. You were walking aimlessly into the darkness of the woods. Now, you did walk directly out into the woods, but voices told you to stay off the road and that they would guide you. As you walked, you realized the whole ordeal had got out of focus. The best solution was a straight line. No more tricks or hiding or subterfuge. You would locate this Jamie and kill her. Anyone in her way would be collateral damage to be taken up to God. Your bullet wounds hurt, but seemed to be healing fast. You limped all the way to your old neighborhood as the sun came up on the 31st. You saw your little sibling's big mansion at the end of the road. The Stella House, it was called. The house used to belong to the wealthy land baron that established Haddonview. Somehow your kid sister had moved up to that kind of station in life while you were gone. You thought of staging up in a neighbor's house next to the Stella mansion Jamie was living in. You approached the last house on the left. 
As you approach the back door of the house, the angelic voices buzz with warning. You sensed witchery. As you entered, you felt an automatic heatwave as a curse activated to kill you. Now the hex isn't strong enough to overwhelm your protective gear, so you only flinched and let out a grunt of pain. It's you, the brother, says a middle-aged woman with short-cut hair. Grabbed a knife from somewhere in the kitchen and charged at you. You easily grab her knife hand and shove it in her neck and misdirect her momentum to crash into the wall with a loud clatter. She gurgles out blood and curses at you as she slides down the wall. You remove the knife to keep for yourself, dropping her to the ground. Nobody else was in the house, but the lady had a bunch of cats. And that's okay, you like cats. You're not an either-or person. You like cats and dogs. That's why you put out lots of treats and left the door open so they could run away and not starve, or not have to eat their old lady owner. For a while, you just waited in the dead lady's home. You stared out the blinds into the street. Police vehicles drive by constantly, and men and women stare out of windows looking for you. But you are shapeless. The blessed clothing hides you. Finally, evening comes. The sun falls and the pumpkins are lit across the neighborhood. You see children instructed to avoid the Stella house, moved down the street by men and women in dark cloaks. You counted eight cultists in the house, dressed in all black, and ten more showed up later. Mostly women, but at least six men with massive size on them. They were probably recruited because of their muscles. It doesn't matter. All that matters is killing the witch, Jamie. Then maybe you can try and live a peaceful life afterwards, even if that's in prison. At least you can live and know you accomplished your mission, and God would give you peace. A Mercedes pulled up, and four men stepped out. The angel screamed with excitement when you saw her, your sister, the final witch alive this generation. As her bodyguards escorted her into the Stella house, you retrieved another knife from the kitchen and prepared for the battle ahead. The massacre ahead. You exit the door and head straight for the Stella house. Part 4 Well, you ask God for forgiveness. You ask God for strength, for wrath. You prayed all these things as you jumped through the window of the mansion of the Stella House, landing in some sort of guest bedroom on the first floor somewhere. You felt the pain of multiple spells and hexes hitting you and burning around you. You heard the shouting of cultists coming to find you. You raised your two large kitchen knives and readied yourself by the bedroom door. As soon as you saw the doorknob had begun its turn, you launch yourself through the wooden barrier in a fury of motion, blowing the door apart into splinters. You heard a gunshot go off as you slice the throat of a surprise cultist. You turn to see two more men backpedaling in the hallway. Plunge one of your knives into the closest man's solar plex and let it go. He gagged and fell down the hallway with his shotgun in hand. The last standing cultist tried to swing a bat at you, you just tank the hit of the steel baseball bat, letting it reverb off your head. Yes, it hurt. Secretly, you enjoyed what you did, and theatrics secretly made it more bearable. The bat-wielding cultist looks wistfully at the shotgun on his dead friend behind you. Before he could dive or make a move, you grabbed him by the neck and lifted him into the air. He slammed his squirming body into the wall behind him, and with a scream of protest, stick your remaining knife through him pinning him there, his feet dangling. Before moving down the hallway, you retrieve your knife from the dead shotgun man's chest. You've turned a corner into the hallway to enter a larger living area. You are immediately bombarded by pistol rounds. Most shots fly wildly around you, busting out windows and pelting furniture. You picked up an average-sized love seat and hurled it at your attackers with great exertion. Flying furniture smashed directly into the tight stairway where your attackers were shooting from. Two cultists were stranded in the living room area with you, cut off from their friends on the stairway. 
You grabbed one of the cultists by her mouth and slung her out of the window with the force you used on the love seat. We hear her neck crack before you whipped her like a rag doll through the glass. You notice the next cultist just stood and waited for you, patiently. You looked over to see the cultist stuck on the stairs, not making any attempt to unjam the love seat or shoot at you. You realize this man wanted to fight you, and was not afraid. The new enemy was a shorter man, but well muscled with a bald head and oiled goatee. An immaculately drawn snake tattoo was coiled around the left side of his head and down his neck. You had a feeling that tattoos were all over his body, just like yours. Oh, God's murdering dog, he said to you with a waving gesture. You took a half step and he launched at you with a tackle. He only shook you as he impacted into your midriff with all his force, but then he quickly pivoted to slide behind you and squeezed you tightly. Before you were taken to the mental facilities, you remembered watching wrestling on TV. You knew this guy was a pro, and you were about to get suplexed. He did just that by lifting you up and over to smash you through a coffee table by the couch. Oh, it hurt. You could see stars. You landed right on your head and smashed the edge of the table to bits. The knife was gone, and he disarmed you through pure blitz to your system. You laid on your back out of breath and disoriented. You could already feel him climbing on top of you. The snake-faced man mounts you and begins raining heavy punches down on you one after another. The punches rot your face and cracked your mask. His hands bleed, but he punched your face anyway. This man was bred to kill you. You can't, the voice screamed in fury at you. It's not where your path ends. He's just a snake from the devil sent to bite your heel. You must crush its head. Well, they found the biggest and toughest man to kill you, you realize. And you reach both your hands down to grab the snake man's private parts as he tightly straddles on top of you. In a brutal motion, you take no joy in performing. You squeezed and ripped. Snake man doubles over in pain and you headbutt him straight to the nose and threw him off you. He crawled around on the ground for a while until he finally passes out from shock or dies. After that, the tide turned dramatically in your favor. Most of the cultists watched you from the stairs and were terrified. When you found a hatchet, you worked your way through them. They fell before your righteous fury. When you made it up the stairs, you could hear the chanting. The ceremony for Jamie's powers had begun. They were, of course, locked in the master bedroom at the end of the hallway. You took a lot of bullet damage in the second floor hallway. The vest was a literal godsend, and your blessings meant you had bullets stuck in your limbs a lot. I used a lot of people as bullet shields and actually turned a couple of shotguns on the cultists, point blank to kill them. That was a new experience for you. Finally, you kicked open the door to the ceremony room and threw your hatchet end over end at the tiny teenager standing in the middle of the pentagram. The cultist jumped in front of it and got his wig split instead. The last two cultists in the room attack you with knives and you bash both their heads together with a sickening crunch and drop them like unwanted dogs. It's just you, Jamie the Teenage Witch now. It's after midnight, she said to you in a sing-song voice. We did the ceremony. It's November 1st. You step forward. What does it matter? You'll kill her before she bewitches anyone like Judith did to poor Robbie. What does it matter? She asked, pulling the fort from your head. They say I'm the profane virgin. They say I don't have to have sex to enchant people. I can do it just by talking to them. She looked at you. You felt a heat burning all over you. It's like a mixture of electricity and needles. She purses her lips. The voices of the angels are gone. Maybe you should kill yourself, she says. You pulled your mask off and began to dig at your face. You've thought about it before, about how painful it would be. You decide to kill yourself that way. The mask hits the floor and your face begins to bleed as you dig at it. 
Jamie laughed with joy at the first sign that her blessing had worked. He laughed that her dark lord gave her this great gift to punish the hunter that followed her and her sisters life after life. Your god can't make you stop? <laughs> Jamie laughed as you dug your fingers into your face. You scream. You can't talk, but you can scream. You scream with pain and hatred towards Jamie and her witch sisters. Do you lose again? Does evil win? Another life of blood and piss up in flames. Oh, you charged at her, half screaming, half crying. You scream so loud, you can't hear her commands to stop. Your hands were too busy scratching your eyes to read her lips or body language. You slammed into her frail body like a freight train at full sprint. When you smacked into her, you grabbed her up in your rage, and you broke through the attic window behind her. You both fall three stories to land hard in the front lawn outside. You felt her body crunch beneath you as the two of you hit the ground like a meteor. You hurt. You can't get up. You can't move. She's under you, looking at you, wheezing. You'll lay here until she dies if you have to. Then a cop car pulled up, and you looked up to see Sheriff Robbie approaching. You thanked God. He has his face bandaged, and he looks even more excited than usual. What are you doing out here, Nick? He asks. I'll have to bring you in, crazy bastard. He reaches down to help you up. Wait, Robbie says with incredulity as he began to lift you and spotted Jamie pinned underneath like a trampled bird. Is that missing? Shoot him. Jamie whispered, barely audible to Robbie through coughed up blood. Robbie quickly, and without hesitation, let you back down, stepped away from you, pulled out his revolver and shot you point blank in the head six times, killing you on the spot. The angels sing once again, finally. You're not Nicholas Norris anymore because he is very much dead. You are the same soul in a contingency plan. You are the backup hunter. You now inhabit a man in a coma for years in a hospital in Haddonview. In his purgatory state, he was offered to move on to heaven and leave his body open to soul transfer. It's yours now, hunter. The angels tell you to finish your job you started on Halloween with this brat. The witch Jamie is still alive. The profane virgin has been severely weakened, but not destroyed. Even now, the coven has reserved a whole wing of Haddonview General Hospital for rehabilitation and speech therapy of Jamie. The hospital wing is swarming with coven security, and has no other patients apart from some invalids who've been in a comatose state in the basement for years. You happen to be a John Doe, who's waking up from his coma in that said basement. Don't worry about her mind trick enchantment on you. Your body is dead. Use that to your advantage. So you woke up in a hospital bed. It's complete silence at first, until the angels told you the room number for Jamie. It was a draw last time. Now, you need to finish her. Part of you realize that this game is endless. This cycle of witch, hunter, victim would repeat regardless of time or place. You wanted to stay in bed as John Doe, but the angelic voices begin to hurt you. You perform the only option left to you. You start doing light calisthenics with the body of the late 40s coma victim. The body, after all, has to be sharpened into your new killer. Well, um, I have to say, uh, Halloween is one of my beloved uh, horror franchises. Um, the first, well, the first film, the second one pretty good too. Um, as um, long-time listeners will know, um, I'm a big fan of Halloween 3, despite that not really being part of the uh, Halloween canon, but yeah, it counts as far as I'm concerned. 
and there have been occasional returns to form, but a fair amount of crap in there as well, it has to be said. So uh, this story kind of um, is up there for me with um, well, some alternative timeline. They've had their fair share of those, and this one takes it in a completely different direction and was very refreshing. So my thanks indeed to Caleb Slieger, the author. Uh, really enjoyed that one. And I hope he doesn't mind me giving a special shout out to KB Hurst, um, one of my favourite collaborators down the years. And it's her birthday today, so happy birthday to you, my dear. I hope you're having a good one. Well, that's enough me rambling on. Um, I'll be back again. I've got so many series that I've started recording, so I've got a bit of a, a backlog of stuff that's on the go, waiting to go. So I'm still rambling, aren't I? Enough. <laughs> right. Lots of good stuff coming up in the near future. Uh, lots of new stuff, uh, rounding off some series that have been left on hold as well. So, something along those lines is coming up on Sunday. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about anymore. Um, Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams and goodbye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.